This next talk is one of six talks we have on technology and differential equations. And Tim Lucas has uh, been working uh, very hard um, and his uh, partner in biology, his wife, as well as students out there at uh, Pepperdine University in the horrible, horrible place he has to live in Malibu, California. And uh, that's probably why he gets so much done because he just doesn't want to go out. It's such a horrible environment that he lives in. But at any rate, um, this is a remarkable tool that you can do from the get go. And I'll let him tell us all about slopes. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Brian. And thank you for inviting me to uh, give a talk on slopes this afternoon. Um, uh, this, this work, uh, at least uh, the the classroom study that we did with Slope uh, was in uh, partnership with my wife who uh, has a PhD in education. And uh, I just wanna tell you a little bit about, um, first about kind of how I approached my differential equations class and then uh, go through some examples uh, that use, that use uh, slopes as a, as a tool for that class. So uh, whenever I'm thinking about teaching differential equations, uh, I uh, like to have a models first approach so that I'm giving, if I'm giving my students a differential equation that they have some sort of purpose uh, behind wanting to solve it, to analyze it. And so everything usually starts with some sort of phys physical assumptions. Uh, from those assumptions, uh, we wanna write down some mathematical expressions. Um, in the form of uh, a single differential equation or, or a system of differential equations. Um, and then I tell my students, um, think before you solve, because the reality is, is that most uh, systems of differential equations cannot be solved and uh, you can't get an exact solution, uh, a nice algebraic form for that. And so uh, I want them to think about all the techniques that they can use at their disposal to learn about solutions to the differential equation before they solve. So that look, means looking at equilibrium solutions and looking at the stability of those equilibrium, equilibrium solutions, uh, doing some graphical analysis. So looking at slope fields and phase planes, et cetera, maybe generating numerical solutions. And then finally, if uh, it happens to be that nice class of differential equations that we can solve uh, to go ahead and look at analytical solutions. Um, so I'm going to talk today about slopes. Slopes uh, was developed with uh, a large number of students at Pepperdine uh, University. Um, it is a, uh, a native app for both the iOS and Android platforms. That's to try to make sure that it, it uh, works seamlessly uh, as, as we're looking at solutions to differential equations. Um, uh, it's been around for a little bit now. Uh, the very first version was back in uh, November of 2016. Um, and then the Android version uh, came around in 2021. Um, it's not on this slide, but it actually also works on the newest Macs that have um, the M chips in them uh, by default because it also has an iPad version. And so you can find it uh, on the app stores for iOS or Android, or even maybe the, the Mac app store um, if you're looking for it. And you can just Google, or I mean, you can just search uh, slopes and differential equations, and it and it pops up quite nicely. Uh, if you just search slopes, then it'll be the third one down behind two skiing apps. So um, there's also uh, another app that I developed that just works for iOS called Waves. It does some PDE stuff, but I'm not going to be talking about that today. Um, so why did I want to work with uh, mobile devices? Um, well, back when the first iPad came out, like uh, I was able to participate in a study, an educational study of how to use the iPad in the classroom. And what we found in that study was that you had these portable, portable devices with comparatively large screens uh, when you're comparing, say, to the um, graphing calculators, uh, but also like they have tactile interfaces. Uh, so that, that people can collaborate on them and they can touch and feel what, what it is that they're working with uh, instead of having to use a bunch of commands on their laptops to, to manipulate things. And so um, with those things in mind, um, uh, or those results in mind, uh, we were able to see that uh, looking back at kind of the 2013 paper that students were more willing to collaborate uh, when they were working on these on these devices versus uh, versus when they were working on laptops. 
And so uh, most recently, uh, we implemented this app called Flopes uh, and then ran a classroom study um, that really kind of goes into how this, uh, the students uh, use that tool and, and how it affects their understanding of differential equations. Um, and uh, that was mostly they were working on iPads and some people working on phones. Um, and that was published in Primus in 2022. So um, I, wanted, I wanted to have like a theme to my examples today. Um, and so I thought uh, one running theme that I could do is talk a little bit about population models. Um, and so when I'm introducing differential equations, kind of a fun one to talk about in Malibu is invasive crayfish. So you have these crayfish that um, were introduced basically as bait um, for fishing in the creeks around Malibu. Um, and unfortunately, people just tossed those crayfish into the creek when they were done uh, fishing for the day. And now we have a large crayfish problem. Um, and so that's a nice species to look at um, because you have things like going on uh, like logistic growth, but you also have uh, you have this idea that we want to eliminate these crayfish from the creeks because they're threatening the local amphibians. And so you see on the right with the pictures, you have traps and things that they put out in these creeks in order to, to try to get rid of uh, the, the crayfish. Um, and why would we do that? Because we'd want to save uh, amphibians like this cute little guy, uh, which is the California newt. Uh, and so, so that's kind of be a little bit of a theme of what I talk about at the beginning of this. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to look at some population models for them. Uh, so, so I'll start uh, kind of working through a progression of models that I would work through with my students. So something simple like exponential growth, um, then maybe uh, a constant removal from the system. Uh, and then uh, obviously, you know, things don't grow exponentially. So we can look at a logistic growth and then we can look at kind of two different ways in which you can remove crayfish from the system. One of them is a constant removal. And the other one is if there aren't that many crayfish, maybe you can't remove a constant amount, uh, say per month. Uh, instead, you might remove a proportion of the number of crayfish that are there. And so I'm gonna kind of talk about um, some of these models as we look at them using, using slopes. Uh, so anyway, so let me, um, let me bring up slopes. Uh, so when you bring up slopes, it has five activities and uh, the first activity that's that's there is slope fields. So this is something that you've probably seen before. Maybe uh, you've experimented with um, uh, older Java tools like D field, or maybe you've seen something uh, in GeoGebra, but we've got um, essentially a, a, a slope field that we can work it with. Um, everything always loads an equation right away. So here I'm loading an equation right away. I can choose to edit that equation if I want, um, or I can choose like I can, a, a preloaded model that's on this screen. And so I can choose, say, I'm gonna look at exponential growth. And for a moment, actually this one looks like it's exponential decay. Um, and so for a moment, uh, I wanna talk about kind of what the other theme of, of my, of this kind of presentation is gonna be. And that's uh, looking at, at bifurcations. So bifurcations uh, are when you see, uh, when you change a parameter that you see this qualitative uh, change in behavior of the solution. So you have a, a change in behavior of the long-term solutions. And so the very simplest and first thing that you can see with uh, a C bifurcation is maybe you have this, um, you have this equation Y prime equals A times Y. And you see that like this works for exponential decay. Um, but if you, if you change the parameters so that it's positive, now you have um, exponential growth. And so what's happened is you had a what was a stable equilibrium at zero is now um, an unstable equilibrium. Um, so that's gonna be kind of like a little theme. I'm just gonna keep talking about times that I see bifurcations as we're going through here. Um, when I'm going through like talking about just exponential growth and decay with the students, the first thing I have them do is, is plot the equation and then try to get an understanding of what do these arrows represent? Um, and what patterns do they observe with the arrows and how do those patterns relate to the model and the differential equation? So in this case, uh, you can see there's a pattern that as you increase, uh, as you increase time, you don't really see uh, any change in slope. So horizontally, they don't see a change in slope, but if you increase vertically, if you increase uh, the population, then you will uh, see an increase in the slope. 
Okay, and then they can relate that to the idea that the growth rate is proportional to uh, the current population. Um, and, and then I ask them questions about when you put solution curves, so you kind of tap on the screen and put solution curves on there, what kinds of patterns do they notice with the solution curves? Um, hopefully they're seeing that the arrows are tangent to the solution curves. And so what they're really getting here uh, when, when looking at slope fields is, oh, okay, solutions follow those slope curves. Um, of course, that's just uh, if you have exponential growth, um, something that you can do, and I'm going to uh, go with some specific numbers here, but something that you can do is, is you can, uh, say, take away a constant amount of crayfish per month. So we'll say we're working in like thousands or something. Um, and so uh, so notice, by the way, that I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the uh, size of the screen to change. You can't really see it, but I'm using my fingers to kind of pinch and stuff to get the size of the, of, of the window to change. Um, but essentially, uh, so if we're looking at uh, the kind of the same growth equation, but we're taking away a constant amount of crayfish per month, well, what happens? Well, depending on the population of the crayfish, um, initially, sometimes you'll see that the crayfish will just continue to grow, but if there's a, a smaller amount of crayfish, um, then you'll see that they start to die out. Um, and so, so we can again ask students to make observations about the arrows and the patterns. Uh, a lot of times when I uh, make these observations um, or ask them to make observations about the patterns, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll notice that, that the graph that I'm, you're seeing here is just a shift. Uh, it's a shift where we shifted the equilibrium up from 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 the graph that we had uh, previously. So you can even kind of see that as you can see the kind of the as I as I make the uh, the amount of crayfish that I'm trapping go down, then the equilibrium kind of moves moves down. Um, and this, in the same respect, if I want to increase um, the trapping, uh, so if I increase the constant by which uh, I number of crayfish that I can trap every month. Then, um, then you'll see that for larger and larger initial populations, we can uh, we can kind of remove the the crayfish from the system. So, um, so that gives you a sense of like of how I'm trying to talk about a lot of things at once. We want to talk about the models. We want to talk about what the pictures are um, and make observations. And and then you want to connect what you see, uh, say on slopes, and then and then what's going on. Uh, with our, say, crayfish population in this case. Um, so obviously, um, exponential growth, um, unlimited exponential growth is, is, is not something that actually is going to happen. So maybe we want to look at uh, the logistic equation. Uh, so, so I can bring up this model button, and I did it too quick again. But um, I happen to have a logistic equation as one of my examples here. Um, and then I can have uh, students now making observations about, wait a minute, what's going on with solutions now? Now they're not growing forever. What's, what's going on? They seem to be tapering off. Uh, what value are they tapering off at? Um, they can get some sort of, um, they can make observations about the uh, logistic growth model in that way. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing. I also uh, wanted to talk about like what happens when you add some harvesting uh, of, of the crayfish and trapping of the crayfish in the model. So su suppose we trap, we um, suppose that we uh, subtract a constant amount um, each each month. So what's that constant going to be? I'm going to set it to be 1.25 in this case, just because I know something that's going to go here. And then you can see at this point um, with that constant amount, we again have that behavior that uh, we can have crayfish that are dying off if we start at a certain um, at a certain population. But if if um, if the population starts above um, that, a, a certain constant, then it's gonna it's gonna approach approach that constant amount. So we have I've I've, I've shifted the equilibrium which was ten before, and we've kind of shifted it down. It looks like uh, it's about five. Um, but what's interesting here is, is that this point that I've chosen or this, this value for, for the trapping um, that I've chosen, which is about 1,250 crayfish per month, right? It's, kind of, it's a special number there. If I go just above it um, and I trap more, you'll notice it doesn't really matter what the initial conditions are, um, that that trapping will make the crayfish population go down to zero. If I go just below it, say here, 
Um, then you get an interesting behavior where there's actually two equilibrium solutions and you've got that um, solutions above the upper one are approaching the upper one. Um, solutions below the lower one are kind of going to zero. Um, and then in between, you've got solutions that are approaching that upper equilibrium. And so what's fun here is you can see uh, what's called one of those saddle node bifurcations because uh, you have two equilibria and then as you increase the, the constant, it gets to right at 1.25. I'll just put it in there. Um, you get exactly one equilibrium value. Um, and then if you go beyond that, you have no, no equilibria. And so students can use these, like they can play around with the parameters. You can ask them to play around with these parameters and say, oh, is there, is there a trapping amount that will work no matter what the initial population is? Um, you know, and you can ask those kinds of questions, like what's the tipping point uh, for, for effective trapping? Um, and then you can kind of see the same behavior if you do um, uh, trapping that's proportional to the current population. And I'm gonna make sure I get my constants right. So here I'm gonna trap actually a little bit less. Um, so you'll see there's kind of right here, um, there's this uh, single, ooh, this is interesting. I'm gonna kind of zoom in so that I can kind of look and see what's going on. Um, so there seems to be an equilibrium. Um, interesting. Probably it's harder to see on this one. Uh, you've got solutions. There's only one uh, one equilibrium here, and solutions are approaching that equilibrium um, from above, or they're uh, in the negative area. They're just kind of going down to negative infinity. If I do a little bit less trapping, you'll see again we have um, the two equilibrium solutions there. Um, and so, so you'll have that the crayfish populations persist. If I go higher, I think what you see is, is that crayfish populations are dying out, that zero is still in equilibrium, but there's actually um, a second equilibrium kind of down below. And what happens is, is that uh, as you go from a little bit amount of trapping, um, you have, the upper equilibrium is stable and the lower one is unstable. And then if you kind of move through and increase the trapping, it goes so that the, um, can I increase it? That uh, the, the lower equilibrium is now unstable and then the upper one is, is stable there. So zero changes from being an unstable equilibrium to a stable equilibrium. It's kind of a, a fun little thing. Um, uh, things that are kind of cool, once you've found a model that you like, um, you can use the share button, you can actually share, you can actually airdrop, at least on the iPhones, you can airdrop the, the model to somebody else so that they will want to look at it. You can export the graph if you like. Um, you can export a table of solutions. So if you're working on something and then you want to visualize it something else, you can export a table of solutions, kind of does all those things. Um, so I just wanted to kind of work through an example like that to kind of see like, okay, how would you use this in class and what kinds of questions might you, might you talk to the students about? Um, so I'm just going to spend just a few more minutes just talking about what some of the other um, activities are. Um, when you got, usually you'll traditionally kind of move on to second order differential equations. And so here you've got, um, uh, you've got a mass spring system. Um, and it doesn't have any sort of damping on it. Um, and so you can, uh, it has like a little demo where you can see the mass and the mass is just going to uh, go up and down forever because um, there's no sort of damping on the system. Um, but then if you want, you can add a little bit of friction by adding a little bit to the coefficient of Y prime. And, and then now what you have instead of an undamped oscillator, you have say, and uh, an underdamped oscillator. So, so it's, um, it's going to be oscillating with, with a amplitude that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing. Of course, um, if you keep increasing the damping, you'll start to uh, see that the, the amount of oscillation is, is uh, starting to go away. Let me see if I can 
make it keep kind of going away. Um, and then eventually, as you increase the um, as you increase the damping, you'll notice that there doesn't seem to be any oscillation anymore. Okay, and so we, of course, we talk about these these terms. We talk about underdamped oscillators. If you add a lot of friction, you have what's an overdamped oscillator. But then the students could maybe find again that bifurcation point. Where is it that that what is that point where it lies where it's critically damped? Where where it's just between oscillating and not oscillating, and it's somewhere right about here. And you can you have to kind of I think you'd have to zoom in a little bit more to to really see that it'll start to oscillate just just a little bit as, as you go below four. So right at four for that damping coefficient, um, you've got that critically damped oscillator. Anyway, so there's all sorts of fun things that you can um, you can do with the mass spring stuff. Um, Tim, we got about we got about five more minutes, and you're doing great. And we're getting lots yeah. of we're getting lots of oohs and ahs in the chat. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm catching it as I'm going. Um, so uh, the other thing that kind of shows up, uh, um, or, or, or another thing that's kind of fun, um, of course, is to work with um, phase planes. Um, and so uh, again, when you open up the phase planes activity, instead of just having nothing there, it opens up and it has a classic predator prey system. Okay, you can add solutions. You can click again on the screen to add solutions, um, and then you can. Uh, uh, you can see on the iPad, you can see both uh, the phase plane picture and the time solutions, right? And so the blue, the blue curve matches the X population, the, uh, the, the orange curve matches the Y population in case that, that's the prey in this, or sorry, the uh, predators in this case. Um, but you can kind of see both pictures when you're on the iPad at once, which is nice because you can uh, use this little trace button and then it'll trace through the curve and you can kind of see how moving through around this uh, closed orbit on the uh, phase plane gives you those uh, give you those periodic solutions. Um, what I want to mention, if you're using this on the phone, you can't get both pictures at once, but you can use arrows and things to kind of go back and forth between these two pictures. And so that that's good. Um, I've, uh, I like to bring up this, I have this example. Again, I've been talking about different bifurcations. So I thought it would be fun um, to look at this Vanderpoel oscillator. Um, and so you can like put a picture on the screen. Of course, this is kind of a, a funny looking, uh, periodic solution that you can look at. Looks kind of heartbeatish, I guess, or maybe it's a crazy heartbeat. Um, but in this case, uh, with the parameter A there, if I make it three, uh, then what I have is, is uh, I have a, a source um, and, that, and that's interesting. But if I change it to one, um, what you end up having is instead of a nodal source, you end up having a, um, a spiral source, and that's kind of cool. If I change the parameter to zero in this case, um, then you just get a center and 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 you get that kind of a nice periodic solution there. Um, if I change that parameter to negative one, um, then you can now start to get a spiral sink. You can see that I kind of put another uh, solution in there and you can see the spiral sink. Um, and then if you keep going further and you change it to negative three, you end up with um, a nodal sink. And so again, here's, it's just a fun example, this one of, of looking at bifurcations and looking at qualitative changes in behavior um, based on, based on the uh, changing that one parameter. Um, I'll just mention real quick that there is a systems, the systems comes up with that classic SIR model um, as, as, a, as a, a first example. This was done way before COVID, but it turns out to be fairly relevant. Um, and so you can put in a system, you can put in extra equations. If you want, um, add another equation. I'll just do U prime equals U um, just so that there's another equation there and another solution. Um, but you can put up, I think, to 12 equations in here. And then you can, um, it, it's really, really good when students are working on projects in my class. They use this, this system is kind of a rapid prototyping playground where they're looking at their parameters for their systems and they're looking at, at seeing kind of what's what's going on. And it's great that they can get that visual right away. Um, I'm gonna just finish uh, by, I'm gonna just say a couple uh, things about student feedback. 
Uh, so from, from our classroom study, we had students say it's good just because visualizing helps a lot be able you to be able to understand, especially when you get to higher levels of math and things get kind of hard to understand sometimes. And they say, uh, I really love how interactive it is. You can move it around and manipulate it. I like being able to click and see, okay, what does the solution with this initial condition look like? So generally we've had positive feedback from the students. Um, I always acknowledge my student developers um, who worked with me on the project. There's a lot of people with a lot of varying uh, contributions. I always uh, especially shout out Joshua Haug and uh, Jacques Jobert and Alex Prieger who did a significant amount of work on, on, on getting the initial version, the phone version, and then the Android version up and going. Um, so yeah, that's uh, my talk about slopes. If anyone has any questions, they're welcome to ask. I think uh, we can tell from the enthusiasm of the uh, chat that people are excited about this. And as one who has downloaded it and used it and plays with it, uh, I think as a teacher tool, just to play what if games before you go into class from the teaching pedagogical perspective is, is invaluable. Uh, are there any other a quick question or comment? Thank you, Tim, it's really awesome. I really appreciate it for sure. There you go. You have a fan. Okay, Thank so, you. Um, you can always send me email um, from you just directly or or um, from the app. You can send feedback if you have any uh, questions or whatever. And then there there are some example lessons and things that are on my website on slopesapp.com. Uh, if you're interested in in trying to figure out how would I use this in the classroom. Well, again, thank you very much. And um, such an application, I've always said, is worth the price of admission to anything where you go to learn about it. And Tim, I, I appreciate your uh, sharing because that's what you've been doing. You're sharing your life's passion with us and uh, your students and your wife's sort of educational observations about the validity of this tool. So um, we, we now have some converts who will be downloading right away, I'm sure. Um, so again, thank you very much.